Okay everyone, welcome back for more biotechnology. So this video is going to be a direct extension of the last video which discussed, discussed the pH scale and pH measurement in making solutions. So as we have already established, molecules that are an important part of biotech applications like proteins and nucleic acids, we really need to keep them within a narrow pH range in order for them to maintain their structure and function. So a way that we can do this and make sure that the pH of a solution does not change too much is to utilize chemicals called buffers. So a buffer is a chemical or mixture of chemicals that resists changes in pH because those same chemicals will act to neutralize any added hydrogen or hydroxide ions as they are formed. So most buffers are going to be a mixture of a weak acid, which we can represent as HA, H being the hydrogen ion that that acid will release, and its conjugate base, the A with a minus charge on it, basically the acid after it has uh, released its hydrogen ion. So the weak acid will partially ionize in solution like this. So HA will ionize into a hydrogen ion and then the conjugate base. Now keep in mind, we call this a weak acid because the weak acid does not give up all of its hydrogen ions. A certain proportion of the HA molecules in solution will give up their hydrogen ions, but not all of them, and certainly not the vast majority. A strong acid like hydrochloric acid will give up all of its hydrogen ions, and there will be no HCl in solution. So this is a weak acid right here, something like carbonic acid or acetic acid. So when the hydrogen ion concentration in solution that has a buffer in it starts to rise, that hydrogen ion that is being formed can be neutralized by the conjugate base. So that conjugate base, the A minus, can take on that proton that has been formed, that hydrogen ion that has been formed, and it can reform HA. So that prevents the hydrogen ion from being a part of the solution, so it doesn't count against the pH. And the same can be said for when hydroxide ions start to form, meaning the solution is starting to become more basic. It can be neutralized by any hydrogen ion is, that is in solution, or it can be pulled off of any remaining weak acid molecules. Those hydroxide ions can steal away the hydrogen ion from those HA molecules, and that would just give you a molecule of water. Again, those hydroxide ions do not count against the pH value because they have been neutralized before they can do so. So for example, like we said, carbonic acid, H2CO3, is a weak acid that is commonly used as a buffer along with bicarbonate, which is its conjugate base, HCO3 minus. Other types of buffers may be the exact opposite. They may be weak bases and their conjugate acids, meaning acids, excuse me, excuse my French. Uh, so weak bases and conjugate acids. So that HB positive indicates that the weak base has picked up a hydrogen ion. That's what bases do. They take on hydrogen ions. That is what we call the, uh, the Bronsted-Lowry definition of what an acid or a base is. An acid gives up hydrogen ions. A base takes on hydrogen ions. So a good example of a weak base acting as a buffer is something that is called tris or trisma base. So this is a very common buffering agent for biotech applications. So the theory of how these types of buffers work is pretty much exactly the same. It's just a little bit opposite because we're dealing with bases rather than acids. So the weak base will accept a hydrogen ion from water according to this equation here. So the weak base plus water will give us the conjugate acid, HB positive, and then a single hydroxide ion. So when acids are added to a weak base buffered solution, those hydroxide ions can accept the added hydrogen ions and reform water. And that prevents the hydrogen ion from making the, solution, uh, the solution's pH go down. When bases are added, the conjugate acid will donate its proton, its hydrogen atom, and then reform the weak base, which is B. 
Either way, like I said, the total concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide in solution are not going to change too much. Thus, the power of buffers in preventing the pH of various solutions from changing too terribly much. But as you can imagine, there is going to be a limit to the buffering capacity of any particular system. There, it, it's not ironclad. It can't. You can't just add a gallon of acid to a buffered solution and expect the pH to not change after a while. So if you do add enough acid or base, then you are going to convert all of the weak acid or base or all of the conjugate base or acid into another form. They're going to be completely used up and the buffer will no longer be able to buffer in that particular direction. So look at the buffering system here, the one that uses a weak base and its conjugate acid. So if we uh, continue to add acid to this uh, buffered system, we are going to use up all of those hydroxide ions, meaning that any more acid that we add beyond that is no longer going to be buffered, so that would cause the pH to drop. If we add too much base, we are going to use up all of the conjugate acid and it will no longer be able to buffer in that direction either. So there are a variety of different buffers that you can choose from, but the question is, what is the best buffer for my application? Well, there are several different things to consider before we actually go about choosing. So the two most important considerations are, okay, what is the pH of the solution that you want? What is kind of that set point of pH that you really don't want to change too much? And then whatever buffer you're going to choose, you want to make sure that that pH is within its buffering range. If you pick a buffer that has a buffering range that your desired pH does not fall in, that buffer is not going to do you a lick of good. Another thing to consider is that if your solution contains a protein, your desired pH should be close-ish, but not too close to something called the isoelectric point of the protein, what is uh, abbreviated as PI. So the isoelectric point refers to the pH value at which a protein has an overall neutral electrical charge due to a perfect balance between positive and negative charges on all of the side chains. Now, when we, in a later chapter, get into the nitty-gritty of protein structure and function will have a better and more detailed discussion on something like this, but just take this definition for face value at right now. So the PI is the pH value at which the protein is electrically neutral overall. So we do not want to store a protein at a pH that is right at the isoelectric point because the protein can actually kind of fall out of solution because of its neutral electrical charge and its inability to interact with the water that is part of the solution. So we like to store proteins in a solution that are somewhere between one and two pH units away from the isoelectric point. So that is going to influence the desired pH of our solution. Something to keep in mind if it is a protein that you have in solution. So the practical buffering range of the buffer that you're going to be picking is going to depend on that particular buffer chemical's pKa value. The pKa is the pH at which there is an equal concentration of weak acid, weak base, and conjugate base, conjugate acid. So for that uh, weak acid buffering system, the pKa value will tell you the pH at which you have an equal concentration of weak acid and conjugate base. Weak base and conjugate acid if you're dealing with the other buffering system. So the buffering capacity of the buffer will be at its absolute optimum, at its absolute maximum, when the pH is right at the pKa. The further away you get from the pKa, the less effective the buffer is going to be. And when you get about a single pH unit away from the pKa, you are really, really, really getting on the danger point of the buffering system no longer working. So we want to pick a buffer that has a pKa that is less than one pH unit from the desired pH. We get kind of some wiggle room of one pH unit on either side of the desired pH. So look at the buffers in this table right here. So let's start with Tris or Trisma. So Tris has a pKa of 8.2. So 
practically speaking, we want our desired pH to be somewhere between 7 and 9 because 8.2 is roughly 1 pH. It's roughly uh, halfway in between that buffering range. So 8.2 minus 1 is kind of in that 7 to 7.2 range, which is fine. And then 8.2 plus 1 would be somewhere in the 9 to 9.2 range. So Tris has a practical buffering range of 7 to 9. 8.2 is kind of right in the middle of that. Sodium phosphate has a pKa of 7.1, so its practical buffering range gives you a wiggle room of about one unit on each side, 5.8 to 8. Potassium phosphate at 6.82, you get a practical buffering range of about 5.8 to 8. Again, about one pH unit on either side. So do you notice that? So let's consider an example. Let's see if you can pick the correct, PA, uh, the correct buffer to use for this particular application. So let's say that you want to make a buffered solution to store a protein that has a PI of 4.5. So which of the above buffers might be appropriate? Well, if you consider this, we said that for the isoelectric point of a protein, we want a desired pH that is about one to two pH units away. So if we went to the left side of this, we could say, okay, we want our desired pH to be about 3.5 or so, 3 or 3.5. There really aren't any good buffers on this list that buffer at about 3.5, as you can see here. If you look at the practical buffering range, 3.5 does not really fall in here. Okay, so let's say instead of 3.5, let's say either 5.5 or 6.5. So if we wanted to do 5.5, the acetate buffer might be appropriate there. Or if you wanted to do 6.5, you might pick, say, the two phosphate buffers, either potassium or sodium phosphate. 6.5 is comfortably in the range there. We might not want to pick the acetate buffer for this reason here. If our desired pH is 5.5, we are really kind of in the danger zone for the practical buffering range for acetate. We're within that buffering range, but we're not giving ourselves any wiggle room for the solution to become more basic. If the solution tries to become any more basic, the buffering system is not going to give any resistance at all. So if we pick 6.5 and use, say, the potassium phosphate buffer, the pKa of 6.82 is very close to our intended pH value of 6.5, so the buffering capacity should be quite strong. All right, so that's going to do it for this video on buffers and buffering pH values. So I thank you for your attention. We've got one more short little video in this chapter, getting back to concentration and dealing with stock solutions and making dilutions of those stock solutions. So I hope you will join us.